Hi, Pastor Steve here. I want to thank you for listening today, and I want to encourage you because I know that God will truly bless you as you study His Word. So hey, let's get started. Good morning, Lawrence Heights Christian Church. Proud of those of you who braved the cold this morning. It's a wonderful day to worship the Lord, amen? If you'll stand your feet, we're going to begin this morning by singing some songs of praise together, worshiping the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, celebrating His faithfulness, His goodness. He is worthy to be praised, and that's what we're going to do this morning. Let's start by singing, Your Word is a lamp unto my feet. Your Word is a lamp unto my feet.
together. And all I see is the bow. You see my victory. And all I see is a mountain. You see. Fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, how safe you in night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. There's nothing impossible When all I see are the ashes You see the beauty Yes, you do, God When all I see is the cross God, you see the empty tomb belongs to you everything I lay at your feet I'll sing through the night oh God the battle belongs to you almighty fortress you call me force nothing can stand against the power of our God Shot in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortune, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shot in the shadows. said earlier there's so much to praise God for to be grateful for and most importantly the story of his son Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross let's sing about that together are you past the point of weary is your burden laying heavy is it all too much to carry let me tell you about my Jesus do you feel that empty feeling the shame's done
church. You may be seated for a time of communion. I'm blessed to be the one who uh, gets to present the communion meditation today. My name's Jalen. I'm the worship and youth pastor here, and, and it's a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord and, and celebrating all that God's doing, all that he'll continue to do. And uh, this time of communion is a very important time. It's a time centered around the death of Jesus and remembering his loving sacrifice of his life on the cross. It's a time for us to slow down and reflect on our sins and our shortcomings. And a time to be grateful that through Jesus' sacrifice, he washes us clean from all of our wrongs. One of my favorite parts of communion is that it unites us as the church. Outside of the family of God, there are many of things that divide us. But scripture lays out some of the things that we all have in common. One of those things being our sin. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we all have the same problem. We've sinned and separated ourselves from God. However, unlike any other aspect of our society today, everyone has the exact same access and opportunity to receive the gift of Jesus' love and be freed from their sin. Things like economic class, race, gender, political affiliation have no impact on your ability to accept and receive the grace of God. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past or how broken you may feel. No matter who you are, you have the choice to receive Jesus' gift of new life. Recently, here at the Heights, we did a study on the book of 1 Corinthians, and the Apostle Paul wrote some powerful passages on communion in this book. He writes about the purpose of communion, that we partake in the cup that represents Jesus' blood and the bread that represents Jesus' body. And communion is a time to proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. He also shared about how communion unites us. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16 through 17, Paul says, The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. What wonderful news that is, church. So today, as you partake and reflect on the goodness of God, don't forget to be grateful about the uniting power of Jesus' sacrifice. Here at the Heights, we practice open communion, and that simply, be mean, that simply means that we extend uh, the opportunity to participate to all believers in Jesus. So if, if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are free to partake with us. In a moment after I pray, the ushers are going to bring a communion tray around to you, and there's going to be a, a double-stacked cup uh, with the top cup having juice that represents Jesus' blood and the bottom cup uh, having a little bread, and that represents Jesus' body. Um, will you pray with me? Jesus, thank you so much for your love and your sacrifice. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for uniting us, God, that although we may feel divided and, and that may be a hard burden to carry looking at our society and all the things, the conflicts in the world right now, that, that there's one thing that can unite us, and that's the blood and body of Jesus and participating and celebrating and remembering your sacrifice. Jesus, we celebrate most of all your resurrection, that you didn't stay dead, God, but through your resurrection, we can have new life and spend eternity with you. God, I thank you for this time and ask that you'll be with us in our hearts as we reflect and remember you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
church family. There's no rush at all, but whenever you're ready, please stand as we continue to sing together. right. Before they get very far, let's show our appreciation for our praise team leading us in worship today. Amen. And once again, good morning to you, church. As Jalen said, it is a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And to each of you who are watching or listening online, we're so grateful that you're joining us as well. If you happen to be a guest here in the house today or maybe even checking us out for the very first time, we certainly want to welcome you too. My name is Steve, one of the pastors here on staff, and I pray that you have found us to be a church where God is at work and the people are all on mission together. Our mission here is to follow Jesus, love people, and reach the world. 
That's why we exist. That's the whole reason we're here. We're also focused on a very specific vision that God has given us to reach 1% of Lawrence for Jesus Christ. And this vision, this big dream of faith is what our mission will actually look like when we're all living it out here in our church and also in our community. We hope that you'll join us in this exciting effort. In fact, one of the easiest ways for you to get started can be found there inside your bulletin. Hopefully you grabbed one of these on your way in. As I always like to say, this is your weekly connection to so many of the things that are going on here at the church. Inside, though, I also want to direct your attention to that little tear-off connection card. We'd love to connect with you personally. So inside, if you'll find that card, just take a moment, fill out a little bit of information, let us know some of the areas that you'd like to be connected with or interested in serving, and we'll get you plugged right in. Or if you happen to have a prayer request here today, we would love to encourage you and lift you in prayer throughout this coming week. So just let us know what that is, and then for your convenience, you can leave your card back in the offering box, back in the back on your way out. Now, for a time of Bible study today, we're actually kicking off a short topical series on generosity. And I realize that as soon as I say that word, some of you are thinking, oh, man, you see this right here. This is why I don't like church. They're always talking about money at church. Others of you are like, come on, man, Steve, I brought a friend here today, and I told him that we never, ever talk about money around here. Listen, you all can relax. We're not going to be talking about money, but we are going to be talking about God's heart for generosity and the heart that he wants us to have as his church. If you're new around here, then you need to know that this is just who we are. This is our culture. It's our DNA. So I've titled this series, This Is Us. It's a story of who we are and who we're striving to be as a church. So if you've got your Bible nearby or your Bible app, I'm going to invite you to open it up to two spots today. Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians 1, and also Matthew chapter 6, both of them there on the New Testament side of your Bible. As you're making your way there to those starting spots, three quick announcements for you. First, don't forget that Operation Christmas Child is underway. It's actually going to be coming to an end next Sunday, November 5th. So please, please, please get your boxes turned back in so that we can get them shipped out in time for Christmas. Also, as we announced last week, a big announcement, be sure to join us two weeks from today for a special Vision Sunday. In addition to celebrating so many of the things that God has been doing, we're also going to be voting. Members will be voting on an operational budget for next year as well as key leadership positions. We've even made several copies available of the budget proposal as well as a report showing the operational expenses for each of the last five years. Now listen, you don't even have to be a member to get a copy of that. Why? Well, because we're transparent here in all that we do. We make that information available to everybody. We've even emailed all this stuff out to our distribution list, and we have printed copies out there available in the foyer. To top all of that off, I've been teasing a very big, very exciting, very special announcement that we're going to be making that's going to be pivotal. It's going to be transformational even to the future of our church. So please, please, please be in prayer for this process and for our church, and join us here on November 12th. And then last but not least, our next FTW event, Backed by Popular Demand, a special evening of fellowship, training, and worship. It's going to be right here Tuesday night, February, or November 14th, so don't miss out on that. Tuesday, November 14th. I think that's it in the way of major announcements anyway. Hopefully by now you found those starting spots. So with God's word open before us, what do you say we go to the Lord today in prayer and let's ask him to share his heart with us here as we study. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that your mission for the church is still on. You've called us to make disciples. And we know that led by your spirit and by the commission of Jesus, that we can share the hope of eternal life. And we can be generous. So Lord, please help us to go together. That's the vision that you've given us, to reach 1% of Lawrence for you. So please equip us, train us. Help us to enjoy the journey of just loving on our city so that a thousand people would come to know your love. That's our prayer, Lord. We pray it together in Jesus' name and all together in unity. The church said, amen, amen. Well, before we can even begin to understand our story, we have to know where our story began. So let me just ask you, where did your story begin? Well, it actually started before you were ever born. 
In fact, I don't know if you know this or not, but before you were born, the Bible says that God was busy knitting or weaving you together in your mother's womb. Every one of the days that you're going to live your life, he's already seen those days. Every gift that you have, every ability that you have, you are unique, you are special, you are set apart from every other person who's ever been born. And I can prove it to you. I mean, just look at your fingers for a moment. Look at your fingerprints right now. And if you look close enough, you'll begin to realize that the pattern on your finger is different than anybody else who's ever lived on this planet. It's like God has stamped you and said, there isn't going to be anybody else like you. He even calls you his workmanship, calls you his work of art. Actually, in the original language, he calls you his poem. And he's given you so much. So when we're thinking about our story, we've got to ask the question, what is God like? Well, we know that God is the creator. We know that he's created you. He's created everything that we see. He's got this amazing plan and purpose for your life. We also know that God is powerful, that God can heal, that he can change any scenario just like that. We also know that God is everywhere all at once. We know that God has all of these attributes, but the attribute that we want to talk about over the next few weeks is the simple idea that God is generous, and we're going to be more like God when we are giving than at any other time. I mean, one of the most famous verses of the Bible, certainly maybe the most memorable, says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So you see, it's in the very nature of God to give. One of the easiest ways for us to understand the generosity of God is to simply look at Jesus. And listen to what the Apostle Paul had to say about the generosity of God in Jesus Christ. It's 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. I love how it reads in the New Living Translation. There he said, you know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. Listen, that's our story. Jesus was wealthy beyond all imagination. And powerful beyond all imagination. And yet he made himself poor. He gave himself generously. His grace is an undeserved gift to us so that we could receive his generosity and allow him to change our lives. Now, let me ask, if your life has been changed by Jesus Christ, let me hear you say amen here this morning. Amen. Amen. I know that my life has been changed by his generous grace as well. And what do we have in Jesus? Well, if you're somebody who likes to take notes, you could write it down this way. Point number one there in your outline, God gave us everything heaven had in one person. Everything heaven had in one person. So when you and I, when we get Jesus, it's not like we go back to the Father and say, I want more because he's giving us everything in his son, Jesus. And as Paul was thinking about the gift of Jesus in Ephesians chapter one, he He tries to, in that whole first chapter, he tries to describe and express all that Jesus is. Together, we're just going to read a few verses there. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Listen to how Paul describes all that Jesus is for us. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Paul says if we just stopped and thought about it for a second, all that we have in Christ, every spiritual blessing, You even see these words, he chose us, he adopted us, he made us sons and daughters. He's given us this glorious grace. Then he goes on in verse 7, he's also forgiven our sins and he's lavished on us all the wisdom and understanding. He's made known to us the very mystery of his will and he brings unity to all things in heaven and on earth. And he's also marked us with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, guaranteeing our inheritance. And Paul just goes on and on and on. So let me ask this. When was the last time you just sat down and thought about all that God has given you? 
What a great homework assignment that would be for you today, to just stop and think about all the ways that God has been so generous to you. Let me ask, what would make your top 10? Well, maybe you start thinking about the fact that he's given you life, that your heart is beating right now, that you're breathing air. And you know what? You're not in control of either of those things. It's just a generous gift of God. And right now we're in a building where it's not raining or snowing on us right now, right? And then maybe when you leave this place, you're going to drive in a car. Or maybe you're watching from home right now, which also means that you've got technology like a computer or a mobile device. And after you think about all those things, if you're a Christian, well, then you begin to come to the realization, again, that he's saved you and he's also given you a calling. Maybe you even remember the time that he healed you. And as you start thinking about all these things, maybe you start remembering some of the great passages in the Bible, like Psalm 103, where David just starts listing all the ways that God has been so generous to him. Colossians chapter 1, where Paul talks about all that we have in Christ. You see, the thing is, if you hear this message today from a pastor, it says, hey, we need to be generous, but yet you don't really believe that God has been generous to you. Well, then you probably feel like somebody's trying to pry your fingers open or force you to give that small little thing that you have. And sadly, you'll never understand that you are blessed beyond measure. Seriously, it's something that we have to think about so that we can be generous like Jesus and have his heart for generosity. Jesus talked a lot about this gospel of the kingdom. Remember in his Sermon on the Mount, he talked about blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the peacemakers and the pure in heart. Now, you know people like that. They had to be, come on now, Jesus, you you know that's not the way the world works, right? But you know what, if we trust what Jesus says and if we trust his view of the world, well, then maybe we're the ones that have things upside down. You see, in Matthew chapter 6, as part of that Sermon on the Mount, That's where we find Jesus' teaching on treasure. And we're going to read just a few verses together. So once you flip over to Matthew chapter 6, I want you to take a look at verse 19. There Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Then he goes on to say, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are are good or healthy, as it says in some of your Bibles, then your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad or unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one or love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. See, all this has to do with the way we view the things that God has given us. Jesus says, hey, make sure you don't put your affection, make sure you don't treasure all the stuff that you have, like all the money you have or or all your possessions, because if you do, Jesus says, it will make you a slave. In other words, if you've got a bunch of stuff and you're keeping it in your home, well, then you've got to make sure that nobody breaks in and steals it, right? You've got to spend all your time safeguarding it, which is one of the ways that it makes you a slave to it. Literally, any treasure that you have, if the source or the root of it is not God himself, then it will make you a slave. But listen, if Jesus is your treasure, then you can be completely free with all the stuff that you have. I mean, think that through. If your affection and your treasure is on something like your physical health, well, maybe you're working out all the time, you're feeling really good, but guess what? The minute that you step on the scales and you see that you're gaining weight, what happens? It totally stresses you out. Or maybe when you look in the mirror and you see more wrinkles starting to form, what happens? It makes you so sad. Why? Because your body is deteriorating, right? Oh, no. The reality is no matter how much you work out, no matter how much plastic surgery you have, spoiler alert, you're going to get old and you're going to die. I'm just telling you straight up. 
Now, if you're a Christian, we know. We just learned from our previous study in 1 Corinthians, the good news is that we're going to be getting new bodies. Amen? That's really good news. But if your treasure is your physical body, or if your treasure is your looks or your health, then you're going to find yourself frantically trying to stop the aging process when there's just no way to do so. Or if your treasure is your money, well, then when the stock market goes up, you're feeling pretty good. But then when it goes down, you don't feel so good. Or when that credit card bill comes in the mail, then you're really stressed out, right? Because again, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And Jesus is saying that if God is your treasure, if his kingdom is your treasure, then you'll be more free than you've ever been in your life. Then he says something really profound. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. He says, if your eyes are good or if your eyes are healthy, and right there, many of you in your Bibles, you see a little footnote right there. The Greek word for healthy there actually implies being generous. The Greek word for unhealthy can actually be translated as stingy. You see, this whole passage is about the way that we view possessions and money. And Jesus is saying that if your eyes are generous, then your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are stingy, then your whole body will be full of darkness. He's saying something so profound about the way that we see our possessions, the way that we see the world, the way that we see his generosity to us. Basically, he's saying that there's two ways that you could see the world. One is through the eyes of abundance, that, that God is our generous host. He's always given us more than enough to, that more than enough that we need. He gives freely to us, so much so that we can give to other people. But then the other way that we can look at life is through the eyes of scarcity. That mindset says, no, 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 there's only a few resources. And we've got to fight to keep them to ourselves. And we don't want anybody to take our stuff. And listen, that framework right there for how you see the world, Jesus says it will determine the way that you live. And it will also determine your joy. As you read through the rest of that chapter, he goes on to talk about the birds of the air and the fact that they're not stressed out at all and the lilies of the field. They don't have any money, but look at how God clothes them. How much more then does God love you? The point is don't stress out about all that stuff. Don't try to keep things for yourself. God, again, is our generous host and he loves you with an everlasting love. That's what Jesus is teaching. In fact, when you look at all the rest of the stories of the Bible, you see this so clearly. I mean, if you go back to the very beginning, the story of creation where Adam and Eve were in this beautiful garden, and all throughout Genesis chapter 1, we see this repetitive phrase, God gave, God gave, God gave. And again, God is our generous host. We are his honored guest, and he welcomes us at his table. And with God, there's always more than enough. But then what happens? Well, then we see Satan come in the form of a a serpent, as a snake. What does he say to Eve? He says, hey, listen, God's holding out on you. He tries to tell her that God is not a God of abundance at all. In fact, he told you to stay away from that tree because he doesn't actually want you to have stuff. And listen, if you just choose to trust me instead, well, then you could discover a whole new world. And Adam and Eve, they go from being receivers of God's generosity And that's where in the Bible we see this key phrase. It says that Adam and Eve, they took. They went from being those who received the grace of God, who took simply because they could. Then we see the story of Cain and Abel. Remember, Abel is the one who gave God his first and his best. Now think that through. In order to give God your first and your best, that means you actually have to trust that there's going to be enough left over for you. And sadly, that's where 95% of Christians are in America today. We don't actually trust God to provide. So 95% of us don't actually give our first or our best. But Abel gave to God as an act of worship. Because that's what generosity is. It's an act of worship. Whereas his brother Cain, he didn't want to give his first or his best. Because his eyes were full of darkness, because he was so stingy, because he had this scarcity mindset and only saw limited resources, we got so jealous and angry that he actually killed his own brother. Not only do we see that contrast in creation and and the fall and in Cain and Abel, but we also see it in Abraham. 
Abraham was just a guy that God picked and said, hey, I'm going to bless the whole world through you. You're going to prosper. You're going to multiply. It's going to be amazing. And I'm just asking you to be a conduit of my grace. And when Abraham received this reward, what did he do? Well, he gave 10% instinctively to a guy named Melchizedek, who was a Christ figure. It was just his way of saying, for all that God has done for me, I'm going to give back. Because generosity isn't just a response. Again, it's an act of worship. Then we go on and we see Moses. And now with Moses, we actually see this generosity thing becoming a command. So if you're here today and you're a person who says, hey, you know what? I'm a tither and I base my giving on the Old Testament. I give 10%. Well, I don't know if this is good news or bad news for you, but there were actually three different tithes in the Old Testament. So if you took the time to run the calculations, it actually comes out to 23.3% annually. And that didn't even take into consideration their sacrifices, their free will offerings, and their alms that were given to the poor. Regardless, generosity became a command for the way that people would look at the way that God blessed their crops. So they gave back to their community, to the priests, and to God as, again, as a command. Then along comes Jesus, which he himself is the greatest gift of generosity ever. And because of him, it's actually hard to distinguish now between love and generosity because they're so closely aligned. For God so loved the world that he gave. Now, maybe you knew a lot of that Old Testament stuff already. So the question for us today is, how do we become generous like Jesus? Because it's pretty easy to sit here in church on a Sunday morning, and when you hear each biblical example, it's pretty easy to say, well, yeah, that's true. And yeah, yeah, that other one, that's true too. And you know, that that, that other one, it's, it's true as well. But then when you actually have the opportunity to be generous... You're like, no, 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 you, you don't understand. That's, that's my money. Or, or, or no, 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 Steve, I'm, I'm sorry. I just, I can't afford to be generous right now. And the question that we're asking today is, how can we be transformed to, to be growing in the generous image of God? So much so that this just becomes part of our story, part of our culture, part of our DNA. Well, Romans 12, 2 gives us a little bit of a clue. Remember, that's where Paul says, don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He's talking about spiritual formation here. And he says that your soul actually can change. You can be remade as you think the right things and as you do the right things. In fact, I want to give you just a simple pattern here today. I want to challenge you to spend the next few weeks just focusing on this simple pattern. It's the idea of your head and your heart and your hands. If you're taking notes, you could write it down this way. Point number two there on your outline says that the journey of spiritual formation is the journey from taker to giver. It's the journey from taker to giver. So let's just take a moment and think about how do we become those people? How do we change? Well, let's think about our head for a second. The head asks the question, what do I think? What is wisdom? What's my best thinking on this topic? Proverbs 23, 7 says that as a man thinks, so is he. Which means then that the way that you think about money, the way that you think about possessions, the way you think about generosity, even the way that you think about God, it will totally affect the way you live your life. You see, it's not just about what you think, because there's a lot of people who think the right things, and yet they do something completely different. Why? Because we also have to take our heart into consideration. Our heart says, what do I love? What do I desire? Then Where are my desires aimed? I mean, where are my desires taking me? It's the Greek word telos, because your desires are moving you in a particular direction. No, you might even think that something is wrong, but even if you really want it, it's hard to stop yourself, again, because your desires are taking you in that direction. We've all heard the phrase, you are what you eat, but Jesus is telling us here that you are what you love. Whatever you love, whatever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's pulling you in that direction. 
But let's also say, for instance, that your head is saying, okay, I see that God has been generous to me, so I need to be generous to others. I mean, I, mean, I get that. Now I want to become a generous person. I mean, that's the whole goal of my life. But again, thinking and feeling aren't the only things that shape or form your life. You see, another question we've got to ask is, where are my behaviors taking me? If you consider yourself to be a generous person, but you've never tithed or given or supported or helped or served, well, you might be thinking and feeling all the right things, but you haven't actually done anything yet. See, it's the idea of your hands. How? How do I get there? What habits have I cultivated that are activating generosity in my everyday life? I know we've got several runners in our church, 5Ks, 10Ks, half marathons, But for the rest of us, if you just decided one day that you wanted to run a marathon, in fact, you even visualize yourself crossing the finish line and all these people are cheering, how amazing would that be? But between now and then, if you don't train at all, you just show up on race day, what's going to happen? Well, runners have told me that the absolute worst time to start training for a marathon is when you're running a marathon. And that's certainly true. Because if you tried to do that, you're not going to make it. Your body's just going to give out on you. You're going to be filled with pain and regret. Why? Well, because you never took seriously the importance of developing habits and behaviors in your life and in your soul so that when you're running the race, you can actually cross the finish line. So what do you do? You change your diet. You change your patterns. You wake up early and you run. First three miles, then six miles, then 10 miles, because you're training your body for this moment. In the very same way, church, we need to train our lives to be generous. This brings us to our last and simple idea. Point number three there in your notes is also a challenge that I want to issue to each and every one of you, especially if you call Lawrence Heights your church home. And here it is. Don't let God's generosity end with you. Write it down that way. Don't let God's generosity end with you. In other words, if he's poured all this generosity on us, and if this is our story, if this is us, if this is who we are as a church, then how can we train our head and our heart and our hands to become more generous? Because the transformation from taker to giver doesn't just happen overnight. I mean, listen, I have been a Christian for 50 years now. And I've watched God slowly take my hands and pry my fingers open and challenging me to do things differently, to think differently than the world thinks. And as you become more generous, God says, you also become more joyful and more transformed in the image of my son, Jesus. You know what? I'll, I'll confess, I'm still on this journey today. And I know you are as well. But if we go on this journey together, we're gonna see the gospel unfold in a beautiful way. Because Christianity is a faith that we live, not just what we give to the church or what we do privately. I'm talking about every single bit, every aspect of our life, like the way that we listen to people generously, the way that we forgive generously. Whole life generosity is what we're talking about here. As we look at God's generosity, we see that he used the generosity of Jesus to bring healing to the world. So one of the questions we have to ask is, how can God use our generosity to bring healing to the world? Or more specifically, how can God use our generosity to bring healing to Lawrence, Kansas? Where are we aiming our generosity at? Well, here at the Heights, our leadership team, including our elders and our missions team, have been very intentional about where we've aimed our generosity. We've aimed it at special ministry partners that we love, like KU Campus Christians, Insight Women's Center, an Alpha Christian Children's Home right here in our own community. And we're not just just doing that through our monthly financial support, but also special food and product drives and volunteer opportunities on a monthly or weekly basis. We also support area Bible colleges and missionaries around the world. And even more so, God has led us to focus our generosity on helping those who are experiencing homelessness here in our city through our washed ministry that provides mobile shower and laundry facilities at no cost to those in need. Listen, church, Lawrence Heights is becoming a force to be reckoned with. And your generosity precedes you. 
The city of Lawrence has posted two articles on social media, one that was even published in the Lawrence Journal World about the washed ministry and about our church's efforts here in town. And let me be clear, this isn't us sending out press releases to them. No, this is what they are saying about us. And I'm praying that it will cause people to take one more step closer in curiosity, wondering, why would we do something like that? The Apostle Paul told the Thessalonians that the gospel message of Jesus rings out in a city where the people of God are generous in unexplainable ways. So when people approach you and ask, why would you do that? Why would your church do that? You could just smile and say, because we serve a generous God who's given us everything in Christ Jesus. So in that sense, we always have more than enough. Amen? Amen. Listen, this is what we're inviting you into. You've heard me say it hundreds of times, hundreds of times before. You are not an audience here. You are an army. And no matter who you are or what you do or where you live or where you work, you can do this. We can all show generosity to others. There's even this beautiful promise in 2 Corinthians about what happens when we go and when we give. It's 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. And again, I love how it reads in the New Living Translation. There Paul writes, And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have enough. You'll have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. So right now, I want to ask you the question, who can we be generous with? I mean, can, can you do it together as a family? Can you do it as a small group? I'm telling you, it's so much more fun to do it as a group. You get together and you go together. There's just something so beautiful about going and being generous together. As we come back together next week, we're going to be talking about the joy that generosity brings and the fact that the happiest people you will ever meet in your entire life are always the most generous people you will ever meet. Now listen, I want to close this today with a mission assignment for you. It's a challenge. It's, it's a call to action. Your homework assignment outside of here will be to share your story of how Jesus saved you. Make no mistake, that is the most generous thing that you could ever give. Those of you who, who came to our last fellowship training and worship night, you already have your story down. Remember, we practiced, we wrote it down, we practiced sharing it with each other. So you've already got a head start here. But here's your assignment. I want you to share your story of how Jesus saved you to even just one person this week. Or even better, listen to this. Can you imagine what would happen if we all did this on social media? Like if you simply just pulled out your phone and videoed yourself telling your story. Hi, my name is Steve. This is my story. And this is what Jesus has done in my life. And I just want you to know. You see, here's what I figure. Between those attending here in person today, as well as all those who are watching online or listening online, we have about 300 people will, who will have heard this message and have received this assignment. So quite conservatively, if each of us are connected to at least 100 people in some way on social media, well, you math majors are running the calculations already. That means that we could reach 30,000 people with the message of the gospel just this week alone. 30,000. And all of a sudden, our vision of reaching 1,000 people for Jesus doesn't sound so difficult, does it? Even those people who won't come to a building on a Sunday morning, listen, they'll listen to what their friend has to say in person or on social media. In fact, according to Barna Research, in recent years, 62% of people these days are just not that interested in coming to a building to grow spiritually. But 79% of people are interested in conversations about faith with a friend. That's about almost 8 out of 10 people who are saying they're willing to talk with their friend about their faith. Research also shows that 48% of baby boomers use social media, whereas 77% of Gen Xers like me use social media. And then a whopping 90% of millennials use social media. And you Gen Zers are even higher than that. So just stop for a moment. Think about the way that the gospel first went out. The book of Luke was just a simple letter to a friend. But yet, look at how God used that to reach billions of people. God has blessed us with even more opportunities here today. So as we close in prayer today, let's just ask God to use us to be generous with our time and our talent and our treasures. But even more so, 
with our story and trust that God is going to use them to draw people to his love. Because again, that's the most generous thing that we could do. Amen? Amen. Let's close in prayer together. Father God, we thank you for your extraordinary generosity. And we thank you that we can go together now as your church. We pray your blessing on our words and on our actions, and especially on the things that we post online, on, on social media. And Lord, if there's anyone within the sound of my voice who doesn't yet know your love, somebody here in the room or following along online, please, Father, draw them to salvation right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, listen, before we leave, I want to extend a simple invitation. If you don't know the generous grace of Jesus, friend, you can know it today. Here's the deal. You can't earn grace. It's an undeserved gift. You can only receive it. Now, if you're not a Christian here today, if you haven't trusted Christ for salvation, if you're really honest, then you already know that there's this distance between you and God, but this disconnect because your sin has actually separated you from God. That's the whole reason why Jesus came and allowed himself to be crucified. He died in your place and in my place to pay the price for our sins. And if you'll just acknowledge and repent, then he'll save you. The Bible says, repent and be baptized. Today is the day of salvation. So if you're here today and you want to start a relationship with God through his son, Jesus, if you want to give him your whole life and allow, allow him to pour out his grace on you, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to come forward when we sing a closing song. Or maybe you have some other need here today. Maybe you'd like to recommit your life to the Lord. Maybe you'd like to become an official member of this church. Or maybe you'd just like somebody to partner with you in prayer. Again, whatever your need. Here's your invitation. Please come forward as we all stand and sing together right now. Strong and worship.
worship you If it puts me in the fire I rejoice cause you're there too I won't be formed by feelings I hold fast to what is true And if the cross brings transformation I'll be crucified with you Cause death is just the doorway Into resurrection life Join you in your sufferings, and I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing, my song will be saved. No, I won't bow to my hands, I'll stand strong and worship. Death is just the doorway into resurrection life. And if I join you in your sufferings, then I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory with all the angels and their saints, my song will still be singing. My song will be the same. Oh, Christ be Magnify, let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Yeah, oh, Christ be magnified in the altar of my life. Christ be magnified. wonderful worshiping with you all this morning. We hope to see you next week. Have a great Sunday, church. Thanks again for listening today. We'd love to hear from you. If you'd like more information about our church or if you just want to share what God's been doing in your life, drop us a line. Give us a call. Again, may God bless you.